My name is Mikey Mhenna. I'm calling from Beirut. Uh, I'm the executive director of Afikra. Thanks so much for, um, for joining today's call. I'm very excited to welcome our special guest, uh, Maryam Saeed, who, is, who was born and raised in Beirut and currently res uh, resides in New York City. Um, together with Daniel uh, Berenboom, she's a major force behind the West Eastern uh, Divan Orchestra and serves as the vice president of the Berenboom Said Foundation USA. In 2009, uh, Ms. Said published the critically acclaimed memoir, A World I Love, Loved, a story of an Arab woman by her mother. Um, she holds an undergraduate degree from AUB and, and two graduate degrees from Columbia University in New York City. Uh, Maryam has worked uh, for more than 20 years in the financial services industry in New York, and we are honored to be joined by her today. Maryam, thank you so much for joining Africa Conversations. Thank you for inviting me, and I am very happy to, to have been asked, and I, I am very impressed by your organization. Thank you so much. The honor is ours. Um, I want to start with your childhood. Um, you were born and raised in, um, in Lebanon as a young child. Um, can you talk a little bit about the Lebanon you were born into? Yes, uh, I was born during the Second World War and uh, Lebanon at that time was just beginning to emerge. Uh, but of course I was very uh, tiny at that time. Uh, my father comes from Brumana. Many people know that, uh, that uh, town. Uh, uh, when I was a, a child, it was a village. Now it's a huge uh, uh, town. Um, and um, I grew up in Beirut and it was the Beirut of the 50s and the 60s. And I left in 1970 and um, the 70s, the, the change began. And unfortunately, the world I grew up in was a beautiful world, uh, uh, a lovely uh, open country beautiful, uh, people were, were different than, uh, you know, what the generations after me experienced. Tell me about, a little bit about your mother. She was an extraordinary woman. Um, and I'm very curious about, uh, if you can tell us a little bit about her and her career. Um, she's a pretty extraordinary person. Yeah, um, my mother was the daughter of a professor at the American University of Beirut. And when she graduated from high school, uh, the university open, had opened, uh, you know, f opened for women, started accepting women. And she was one of the few women who's, who I think it was second or third year after the women were admitted, she went to the, uni to the university and had a university degree. My mother was, very uh, interested in life, in everything. And uh, she uh, then managed to get a scholarship and go to, to Ann Arbor, Michigan and continue her studies. She was aiming for a PhD, but then after finishing her coursework, she came back to Lebanon, never went back to America because she was offered a job at Ahliya School where she was educated originally to run the school uh, for, uh, for, for one year first because, and then she thought she will go, go back, finish her education. Uh, and uh, she got, she felt, uh, you know, she has a mission and she has to stay in Lebanon. That's her country and so on. So she then be, stayed as, as uh, principal of Aliyah school for 40 years. And um, the school still exists now. In her days and my days, it was a girl's school, but now it's a co-educational institution. My mother uh, uh, wrote her memoir during the civil war in Lebanon, although she had written a version of it uh, earlier uh, after 25 years of teaching. And that version, uh, she wrote for us, her children. But during the Civil War, 
my mother felt very, very upset that all the media had no idea who we are or what we were about. So she had written her, she had updated this memoir she had written in before. And uh, uh, actually she wrote the, the first memoir after 1958 because she was very upset with the first, uh, you know, mini civil war. And- Were you, uh, uh, if I can just interrupt, were you aware of her, did you see her with a pen and paper was it a structured thing or was she just writing a diary? I mean, were you aware of this memoir as a child? No, as a child, no. But she decided, she made a, a, a conscious effort to write. And she wrote it uh, after 58 because she felt that we are beginning to lose our, our um, essence or value. Uh, and she was upset after that, uh, these events. But when she retired, she decided to update her, her memoir. What and year she, was that? Hmm? What year was that? Well, it was in, in uh, 76, I think 77. And uh, she finished it in Arabic and it went to press. And meanwhile, she decided she will rewrite it for a foreign audience. And she gave, she wrote it in English and she gave it to Edward in March of 1979 to find her a publisher in the United States. And Edward told me at the time, it needs a lot of editing. It's written for an Arab audience and uh, the West the, uh, does not understand, uh, will not understand it. Uh, and two months later she died. So for, for many years, we, we, we edited it, we got an editor, they edited the manuscript and nobody would touch it in the Western world. But a friend of mine in 2003, I had showed her this manuscript. She, she is an editor and uh, she's originally Indian. So I, uh, in 2003, I accidentally met her at a party and she said, Mariam, this is the time for your mother's memoir because she talks of a world that in, in, involves Lebanon, uh, Palestine, the, the whole Middle East and Iraq. She, she, my mother taught in Iraq for one year. Mm. Uh, so she talks about all these countries and Bush is about to <laughs> invade Indeed. Iraq. Yeah. So this is when we started writing about it and Edward started advising me on, you know, as we began and he, he began to write uh, a, a small introduction and then he passed away. And after he passed away, um, uh, I, for a while I didn't touch it, but then I said, I have to do it. Uh, I must do it for, for my mother because that was her wish and I must also uh, do it for him because anyway we are all we all are fighting the same fight yeah you know I, I, I've listened to you you know in listening to you talk about it now it seems as though the book almost is you know like simultaneously a love letter to Lebanon a, a love letter to your mother and a love letter almost to uh, your late husband uh, and is sort of a tribute to all, all three things I'm curious to hear uh, you talk a little bit about the audience because it seems as though the audience, the intended audience originally when your mother was writing it was to, as you've said in the past, to her students, to her children, to her students at Ahdiyo, um, letting them know about the essence of this, this world that she quote loved. Um, and then it seems to have shifted slightly to a Western audience to say, Hey, all of you who may be or may or may not be supporting a war invading this place, let me tell you about this place. Did you feel that shift or am I off the mark? Well, it, uh, the audience here, the, the Western audience saw it, uh, saw her as a very impressive feminist woman because mm. she had, you know, progressive ideas and she was not af afraid to, to speak her mind. And she was always, 
uh, you, rem you asked me whether I remember her writing the book. No, but I remember her writing uh, lectures or yeah. talks that she gave on the Lebanese radio or was invited to give at AUB or somewhere else. Uh, so so it, people uh, was interested, became interested in the book because of her personality. But while th they, uh, you know, read it, they also became aware of the history because she, she clearly um, uh, remembers turning point in the history of that region. Was she, was she a sort of a pillar of your community growing up? Can you talk a little bit about the position she held and its importance in the community in Beirut well, and in your yes, sort of personal she, community? She, she was very no, well known in, in Beirut and in Lebanon and among the you know, Arab women, women's groups in the Arab world. Uh, my mother uh, uh, was uh, also interested in arts and culture and was on the board of directors of the Académie Libanaise des Beaux-Arts. She encouraged her, her students uh, the, to, to be part of the choir of the Academy. Uh, and uh, uh, they, they perform twice a year at Christmas and, uh, and at Easter. Um, she was involved in women's rights and belonged to many women's organizations. Yes, she was well known. So I'm, I'm very happy that you brought up the um, her involvement in the arts and in music, because I told you this before the call, I found this, this photo of you um, <laughs> as a child um, playing piano. And this was, this was new to me. I didn't know that, um, I didn't know that music was a, a part of your upbringing. Um, yes, it was. You, it, it, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Tell, tell me about the role that music had in, in your childhood. Well, uh, like many people, uh, I was, Taught, uh, taught I, I had to take piano lessons and I did it uh, uh, like everybody else. But, and like everybody else, I didn't last very long. By age 13, 14, I had stopped playing. I can read music and I, I sang in the choir of the academy, but uh, I am not a musician the way Edward was. Edward was really a professional musician. And at some point in his life, he had he had hoped to study music, but then he changed his mind and went into literature. So um, let's let's use this as an opportunity to segue. I'm sure there will be more questions in the chat at the end about the book and about your mother. <clears throat> so let's move on um, to uh, the genesis of the the foundation of which you are vice president now, Baron Bowen Said Foundation. Um, the website has this quote, and I love, I love the quote. Let me just read um, the mission statement, which is not on the screen, but I'll just read a little bit of the mission statement. It says, the foundation is dedicated to the empowerment of young musicians from the Middle East and North Africa. Um, and it goes on to talk about the, the specific projects. But my favorite part of the website is the following quote. Quote, we are not a political organization. We cannot solve the Middle East conflict. Um, which I love the, the straightforwardness of that. Can you talk a little bit about um, the sort of the genesis of the foundation, um, going back to um, uh, the, the friendship, which was really at the core of the, the starting of the foundation? Um, uh, Edward met Daniel Barenboim by chance at the hotel in London. And the, at that the, the, uh, time, Edward had a, a ticket to his concert that evening. And he, uh, Edward, I tell you what Edward ha ha told me the story is that Daniel looked at him and said, do, do I know you? And Edward gave him his name and then, and then he told him that he was going to his concert that evening. And Daniel said, come, come after the concert and let's have a drink. And th that's what happened. And during that meeting, they, they clicked. They had many things in common. Uh, and 
their upbringing was similar, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But they came from both sides of the divide, so to speak. Daniel is an Israeli, and Edward was a Palestinian. So after this meeting, they became friends, and we got to know him and his wife very well. And after a year or so, uh, they decided that they are having very uh, interesting conversations about music, about literature, about the situation in the Middle East, and maybe they should record their conversations. So they began recording their conversations. And during all this time, then Daniel always used to say, we should do something for our people. We should do something for our people. And they wrote the recorded conversations were published as a book called Parallels and Paradoxes. And for those who prefer to read it in a different language, it's, it's translated into many languages, including Arabic. So they wrote Parallels and Paradoxes, and it's, it's, uh, it shows each one's personality, that they have many differences, they have many things in common, but, um, and they can be friends, they can, they can coexist. And they, meanwhile, um, when the book went to press, um, they had the opportunity for a workshop in Germany. The workshop uh, was also uh, like, like their meeting, a chance. Uh, yeah. Daniel had a, a gentleman called Bern Kaufmann come visit him. He was made uh, director of the, um, the uh, Me uh, Weimar in Germany was, was designated at, as the cultural capital of Europe for 1999. And he wanted Daniel to play a concert. Daniel said, no, I don't want to play a concert, but my friend and I, my friend Edward Said and I would like to do something for our people. And this gentleman jumped on it. And that's how the workshop started. Edward was actually hesitant. He was afraid that he wouldn't get many good musicians from the Arab world. And the people who were auditioning in the Arab world were members of the Goethe Institute. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, they had over 300 applications from the Arab world. They were amazed. Yeah. So they chose the best of them. And they did this summer workshop. Edward uh, was the person who talked about uh, music, about other subjects. That, uh, he, was, he conducted the discussions. And Daniel trained them every day. By the end of the workshop, Daniel realized that he can make an orchestra of this group of Arabs and Israelis. And they played a concert at the end of the workshop. And when uh, and the, uh, the orchestra was called the West Eastern Divan Orchestra because Weimar was the, uh, the home of Goethe. And Goethe wrote this collection of poems called yeah. the West Eastern Divan. And he was a European who believed that the East and West were complementary and not adversarial. And that's how it got its name. It's, it's, it's beautiful. I mean, I, I, I love this story and I love the message. I'll read just for those of uh, the listeners who can't see the screen. On the website, it says, music makes people emotionally receptive. The very structures and forms of music are central to human interaction. The West Eastern Divan Orchestra opens up channels of communication based on equality, cooperation, and justice for all. Our musicians don't just listen to music, they listen to each other. Um, this orchestra and this initiative has been going on for 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, are there stories that um, you can think of, of musicians who have been, who were 20 years old 20 years ago and are now 40 and have, you know, a 20 year long relationships with people that they've met through the orchestra? Well, it is amazing. But, um... The, you know, Parallels and Paradoxes mm -hmm. was dedicated for, to the orchestra when they wrote it, the, because it meant so much to them. 
Yes, it, the orchestra uh, started as a youth orchestra. And when it was as a, a youth orchestra, Daniel used to change one third of the musicians every year so that the standard stays high. At some point, the orchestra began to perform at a very high, high rate. And uh, he decided to make a really world orchestra out of them, a real orchestra, not a youth orchestra. So during those 20 years, there has been uh, a big alumni, so to speak, yeah. of musicians from that orchestra. And I have observed, you know, that the idea was that in, through the orchestra, we, know, we get to know the other. And Edward thought that, um, you know, if they, if we get, if they get to know each other, these, this generation or the future generations will begin to think differently, and perhaps they will find an alternate way of ending this impasse between us. And it, you know, it was taken from a human point of view that people come together; they're human beings. It's not who who they belong to or or. Uh, uh, on what side they, they are. Uh, so not only did this bring Arabs and Israelis together, but in my experience, the Arabs got to know each other because yeah. the Arab world was totally fragmented in the 70s. And people, uh, Syrians didn't know enough Egyptians, Lebanese didn't know um, e uh, Egyptians, Jordan, etc. So they got to know each other and they got to meet the Palestinians from inside Israel. Yeah. And that was also a, a big thing. Uh, also, as far as the Arabs are concerned, the Arabs got to know each other. So we, uh, I think uh, there is a community of Arab musicians that are, as you said, they were 20 or 25, and now they're 40, 45, that have done a lot of interesting things with music and work together all the time. It's amazing. So, so this, this was another byproduct of that. You know, in, in, in one of the interviews, and I, I apologize, somebody corrected me in the chat. I was misspelling, uh, mispronouncing Daniel's name. It's Daniel Baron Bo Boyan, I think. Boyan, um, Baron Boyan. Baron Boyan. Um, I listened to an interview with him and the interviewer said, um, do people argue and, uh, are, you know, are there arguments in the orchestra that you have to manage? And he, say, and he says, there is finally a safe space for us to have these arguments. In fact, we encourage the arguments that we need to talk to each other. Um, and I love that. And then when, when Daniel wanted them to become more and more uh, professional musicians and there were, was less time for discussion and more uh, rehearsal time, they objected. They kept telling him, no, we want to have these, these conversations. Sometimes they were, they were a lot of, uh, full of uh, animosity and anxiety. Sometimes they were not. Uh, we, we used to, after Edward passed away, uh, many people were invited to talk to, to, the, to the orchestra from all uh, countries, all walks of life. And, uh, it was, it, is, it was and still is an experience. But the, the idea now has, has been widened to include people from the region also. So there are yeah. Turks, there are also uh, Iranians in, in this, uh, this orchestra. And the orchestra was such a success that at some point, Daniel thought of the idea of the academy. And he tried to do it by himself, but an academy of higher education needs more than a small group. In the end, we, we, the academy is supported by the German government. And for us, this was a very good thing because the government uh, you know, is supporting uh, a worthy uh, cause of educational cause. And it, it has given everybody the opportunity to apply 
audition for um, uh, higher education in music in Europe. So, yeah. so and uh, the academy was opened in 2015 and has been uh, very well run and uh, a lot of musicians uh, have benefited from this higher degree in music. Can you, uh, uh, just to clear something up, so the orchestra started in 99. Mm -hmm. How soon thereafter did the foundation start? And how soon thereafter did the, the scope widen to include these other initiatives? Well, the, the Germans were very happy with the first workshop. Because they were happy with the first workshop, they gave them money for a second year. So in 2000, they had another uh, workshop in, um, in Germany. Then the Germans apologized. They said, we do not have money to continue this. So Daniel and Edward thought, maybe this is the end. But then Daniel was at that time the director of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. Mm. So he said to Edward, I'm going to convince the people of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra to, um, to host us. And they did. They did host them in, in 2001. Um, However, it, it turned out to, to be very expensive. America, you know, the, yeah. Europe is near to the Middle East and the expense, the, you know, the German government was responsible for, for the workshop and so on. But uh, in, in America, it, it became expensive and it was, the, the group were not housed in the same place. And, and the meals were not proper meals at one, one lunch, yeah. Eight, yeah. So it, somehow it didn't have the same spirit. And then the Americans were not interested in, I mean, the people in Chicago were not interested in continuing. At that point, they were very disappointed and they thought, that's it, that's the end of it. And out of the blue comes a phone call to Daniel Barenboim from a foundation in Spain called Tres Culturas. The head of the Tres Culturas mm. called and he said, we want to invite you to Spain. We want to offer you a home in Spain. And that is when in 2002, they went to Spain and the Spaniards were very generous. The Spaniards suggested founding a uh, foundation. a foundation called Baron Bon Said. And in 2002, uh, in 2003, when we were in Sevilla, Daniel and Edward signed the, 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 you know, the documents to establish this foundation. Unfortunately, Edward died one month later wow. and he never saw it as the Baron Bon Said Foundation. Wow. And I must say, the Spaniards were very generous and they were very good. And they were the ones who encouraged that the orchestra go on tours. And, to, and that is how it got known into the world, you know, to the whole world. Well, I mean, they've gone on incredible tours. I mean, they've played at Carnegie Hall. There is this, um, a documentary in 2006, that uh, Emmy award-winning documentary about um, about the orchestra. Knowledge is the beginning. It's called. Yeah, knowledge is the beginning. It's um, it's incredible work. Um, and there's the ensemble, the smaller ensemble, and the the full orchestra. I want to talk a little bit about the work that um, you're doing. The sort of the third leg of the foundation, which is um, the the work in uh, Ramallah. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about that idea, the, the, the concept, and what's happening there now. Yeah. When Edward met Daniel, the Edward asked Daniel, have you ever been to the West Bank? And Daniel said, no. And, and it, it, it had never occurred to him to even go there. And so Edward said, you should go there and you should see how it, you know, the situation there and you should meet the people there and so on and so forth. And so Daniel said, of course I'll go there. And he 
did go to the West Bank. Edward introduced him to several of, of our friends and he visited. And after, after his visit, uh, uh, he said he would like to uh, perform a concert there. And so I think I don't remember if it, what year it was, but it, it was like maybe 97, 98. Daniel performed a concert in Ramallah. Meanwhile, on a separate, at, at a, a separate side, the people in Ramallah were trying to build a, mu a, a, a music conservatory in Ramallah. And they were, um, you know, uh, trying to establish it, uh, trying to raise money for it. And Edward was like an advisor to them and a supporter of them. And the conservatory had just begun a few years before Daniel's concert. And so the, 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 um, the director of the conservatory, Suhail Khouri, was trying to recruit teachers from abroad to teach music at this mm. conservatory. And the Israelis were not giving him any permits. So they asked Edward, uh, um, they told Edward this and Edward turned to Daniel and, and he said, what can we do? Can you help us get uh, uh, the conservatory get teachers? Daniel is a very efficient person. Immediately he, he finds a solution. And um, he said, of course, I will send teachers from Germany and so Amazing. on and so forth. And the relationship started that way, teaching these teachers from abroad, teaching at the, what is now, it was the, the National Conservatory at that time, but now it is the Edward Said Conservatory, teaching music there. Amazing. However, in 2005, the conservatory did not want to continue this program. So when they dropped the program, we felt that we have the money for that program. And because we have that money for the program, we should stay. And it, we, it started as being a very small, um, small, tiny school. And uh, we had the same teachers teaching there, but it was not, you know, a big, uh, organi organization. And in 2015, we had a Finnish director who took over. And during that time, she turned it around into a wonderful music school. Exactly. And for us, this was really important because this music school is the feeder of of all those musicians who are interested in getting into the academy. Beforehand, we didn't have many Palestinians. And now, you know, we had more Arabs than Palestinians, but yeah. now they, they began to be the same number as other Arabs in other countries. Well, I hope so, one, one day I'll be able to visit, uh, visit the school. I hope. I yeah. hope you will. So, and during, and I must say, I want to commend the, our director is called Lina, and I want to commend her because she does not waste time during this COVID, uh, COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, they set up within one week online teaching, and the students have been taking online teaching. They passed their exams and, and so on and so forth. Amazing. So for us, this is a, a, a very important part of the project now. And, and this small school has an orchestra. The orchestra is made of the students and of other Palestinians on, uh, in the West Bank inside Israel um, called FIMO, Philistine Young Musicians. Okay. And last year, it, they were invited, not last year, it was 2019. They were invited to play at the Musikverein in Vienna, which was a very prestigious venue for them. And uh, we feel very uh, yeah. optimistic about this project. Amazing. OK, I'm going to have to move on because we have uh, need some time left in the chat. Um, OK, so a quick Q&A. Um, what are you reading or watching right now? 
Well, I'm reading uh, Barack Obama's new book. It's a huge 700 page book and I don't know if I'll, get, I'll be able to finish it. Yeah, that's fair. That's, a, that's it's an admirable, uh, admirable attempt. Okay, who would you love to shadow for a day past or present? Uh, I think the most, uh, the person that uh, affected me most in life was Mandela. I would like to shadow him. Yeah. Do, do you have a sense of uh, when you would have loved, loved to shadow him? Um, you know, during the, in the 90s or um, during I think the, the main struggle? Came, I, I think when he first came out of prison yeah. and he, he, he reconnected with the world. Yeah, amazing. Okay, so what do people most misunderstand about your work or you know your line of work? Well, you see, everybody decided, uh, tried, uh, Edward and Daniel started this project as an educational project. And I want to add here that Edward was very, very worried about the Palestinians and education. It has been really volatile with the closures, with the uh, et cetera, et cetera. And he felt that music education was crucial because music teaches young kids to focus. And if you learn to focus in music, you can focus in school. So, uh, so, th so this was very important for him. And the project was really, really, uh, as, as it says on the website, not a political project, but it became very popular. The idea became popular that these two exceptional men have come together to do this. But the media started you know, saying yeah. this, that. And all of a sudden, people began to say that this project is normalization and we should boycott it and this, that, and this. And this is the most, the biggest misunderstanding of all. Yeah. But I am glad we persevered. I'm glad we, we did that, we continued. And I feel we contributed to the education to, of a lot of people from both sides of the divide for many years. And we will continue to do that. And we, there is a place for this kind of education. I couldn't agree more. Okay, last question, then we'll open it up. Whose work do you admire or are inspired by? Edward. <laughs> like so many of us. Um, okay, well, now let's open up to the chat. We have a few questions starting with Rida. Um, Rida, I'm gonna ask you to unmute. Hello, thank you so much for this, Mikey, and uh, yeah. thank you, Maryam, uh, for this thank very interesting for talk. Thank you. I, I would like to ask how you think Al Ahliya school today uh, still might reflect your mother's character. Uh, I know that it is still going, and I am sure it reflects my mother's. Uh, personality because it is uh, a serious school, progressive, secular, everything that I grew up and my mother believed in that Lebanon should be. And uh, it, it, it is non-denominational, non-religious, uh, you know, uh, nationalist, secular, and I think it still is that. And it is one of the few, few, few schools that continued after the war uh, because other schools closed their doors during the civil war. And the person who was running the school at the time, uh, it, it, it became a very bad um, uh, area that, you know, because it's near the, in downtown. And he said, there are a lot of people in this neighborhood and we should, we should educate them during this time. We should not close our doors. And because of this decision, I think it is still going on. And that is, I think, okay, great. something my mother would have done. 
Thanks, Guido. Um, our next question comes from May. Hi, Mickey. Hi. By the way, I'm your father's uh, schoolmate. Perfect. <laughs> Inside them, I can say. Well, I would love to thank you for a very, very interesting um, uh, interview. I was always wishing to meet uh, Mrs. Uh, Saeed, especially that I have uh, attended uh, Dr. Saeed Edward twice in Berlin, uh, 2001 or two, and then once more, I don't know, shortly after. And uh, I was always really wishing to meet you, Mrs. Saeed. We have a common friend who always told me about you, Bayan and Waihe Yes, of course. <laughs> yeah, and I read so many books from your sister-in-laws, my mother, my grandma, and <laughs> all of these. I just wanted to ask you, uh, do you plan any uh, visit to Berlin where it started? I mean, uh, uh, we have the Pierre Boulez Salle. I wonder whether you have attended it. It's, it's in, com uh, well, it's in honor of Edward. And the, because the, the Berenbaum Said Academy is part of these projects. And exactly. I, am, I, am, I go to Berlin quite often uh, and uh, uh, I go with the orchestra on tours when, when there are tours. So mm -hmm. I am involved in that project. The, the Boulez Salle is, is also part of the Academy. Exactly. And that's why we would love to welcome you here and to make it uh, for our uh, um, society. I mean, I'm in the uh, music society in Berlin and the, the Foreign Ministries Cultural Club. So I, we would like really to host you to talk just like what you gave us today in this beautiful interview that uh, people get uh, another side of the uh, uh, East-West Divan, Ost-West Divan, uh, which is so, uh, such a, uh, you cannot imagine Berlin without it anymore. <laughs> so please, yes. when, if you ever plan a visit, let us know. Uh, I, I think Mickey I would. Know. Now, uh, now, nobody is going. Now, on. Not, of course not <laughs> with the pandemic. At, at the end, uh, you know, when this thing ends, I will be going to Beirut, Be Berlin, and I, I will let you know. Great, thank you so much, May. Uh, Jenna. Hi. Hi. Uh, Mikey, thank you for organizing and thank you to the team. Tant Miriam, thank you for making the time to speak with us today. This is such a joy. Um, I've read, I read your husband's memoir as an 18 year old, I think, and I found it so moving and I loved your mother's memoir as well. And I feel like they're just such blessings for us to have. Um, and I love that both of them took the time to write their stories. I'm curious, since you have such a fascinating life and I think you're such a fascinating person, are you writing a memoir or have you thought about it? Because I would love to read it. Well, uh, I am I am personally not not a good writer like oh like I'm sure you are was or or my husband I toy with the idea but I haven't gotten around to to think you know to focusing on it or do it seriously okay but well if you knows, perhaps okay if you do we would love to read it yeah, and hear your story thank you. Thanks, Jana. Uh, we have another question from Rida, and then we have a question from Ria. Rida. Thank you, Mikey, me, Mikey, for giving me the opportunity yeah, to ask sure. another question. Um, Mrs. Saeed, um, Dr. Saeed had said uh, in a book that I have that's called uh, Culture and Resistance, um, it's conversations between him and uh, David Barsamian. And he says that what makes music interesting is the balance between dissonance and consonance with the weight of a piece really based in dissonance and discord rather than the other way around. Um, do you see this as relating to uh, Dr. Saeed's belonging to both worlds, the Arab and the American? And do you feel the same? Uh, you know, I think th uh, this also comes from another concept, very important concept that he wrote about, the, the concept of contrapuntality in music, which means that there are two voices going against each other uh, uh, musically, but the result is harmony. 
this is how he saw, saw this orchestra. That, uh, it, it, you know, uh, there is dissonance, as, as, but then when they're together, the result is harmony. And he uh, applied this concept of contrapuntality uh, in his book, Culture and Imperialism. Uh, and he applied it to literature. But uh, yes, he did believe in that. And maybe it is because he's from both worlds, but I don't know. Great, great question, thanks. Ria, you're up next. Uh, thank you for this, this lovely um, talk and, and for clarifying a lot of, about, about these issues. Uh, I think the, one of the biggest legacies of Dr. Said is, is that he uh, clarified for us our relationships with, with each other as people, as West and East, as you know, in this, in this struggle that we're all living through. And um, at a time now when, uh, you know, this, this uh, effort between him uh, and David created this um, um, conversation between East and West and, and enriched it. Um, at a time now when we have so many difficulties and struggles uh, conversing and communicating and existing, coexisting, what is your biggest hope going forward? Well, I do hope that we will be able to, uh, to change the discourse that, we, uh, that puts us always in an impasse, whether we are Lebanese or do the Palestinian question or any other issue in the Arab world. I mean, I dream of the day that we can uh, communicate on a certain level and we can go forward. Uh, I mean, I am, to be honest with you guys, all of you young people, I'm very impressed with. And I sometimes in this world, um, we, we overlook things. For example, when the uprising in Lebanon began before all this changed, uh, I was most impressed by all these Lebanese young people who were interviewed and who spoke very, very good classical Arabic. And everybody used to make fun of the Lebanese and they don't know Arabic and they don't know this. But, you know, we, we are not, uh, uh, it showed to me that even under the, the during the war, after the war, uh, the young people are very serious, are very hardworking, and there is a future for us because of you. Thank you so much. What a beautiful uh, note to try to end on. Um, Mariam, I have one last question for you. Um, what, are, uh, what are you most excited about right now in terms of what the um, foundation is working on and what should we keep an eye out for as a community? Uh, I am most excited about the project in, in, in Ramallah because I think this is, if we, uh, we continue, if we are able to continue to support it financially, it will become a very important institution that educates people. And uh, this is what I spend most of my time doing. That's fantastic. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this was a real pleasure to have you on. Um, there is so much to talk about, but um, to all of you on the call, if you'd like to connect with um, the foundation's work, you can uh, look up the foundation online. There's a lot of good information. There are some amazing videos on YouTube. Um, some of those interviews that Mariam was mentioning or the early conversations, the recorded conversations um, are on YouTube. You can go and look at them. They're beautiful, so much uh, great wealth there. And the book is out wherever you find books. Um, Mariam, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, and I really uh, I'm very impressed by you. Thank you so much. Um, last two notes, uh, if you'd like to give us feedback on today's call, I put the link in uh, the chat. It's a single question, was this good? Um, and if you'd like to support Africa and help us keep doing what we're doing, uh, keep growing and have events like this that are open to all that are intended to cultivate curiosity, consider being one of our monthly supporters who help make this work happen. Um, 
I put that in the chat as well. And uh, aside from that, I will see you all on Saturday at our next event. Maryam, thank you so much. Thank you.